Um, I'm going to let you remain seated. Isn't that fun to start without having to stand up again? That's great joy. About May time this year, I was in New Zealand, and uh, we were doing something similar to this. And uh, I had the, the community there do what I'm going to invite you to do in a moment. I invited them to stretch up their hands, said, the presence of the Lord is here. And often in the Bible, his presence is described as oil. And I said, this is imaginative play. This is kind of what you'd do if you were kids. But his oil is all over the room. And we're going to reach up into his oil. And we're going to receive whatever he wants to bring. And I was encouraging, particularly those who were deaf, uh, to reach up into the oil. Well, anyway, there was a young man there. And he had served in the forces. And he had been uh, too near a machine gun fire. Uh, he was one of the guys who was, I think, loading the guy. I don't know what he was doing. But he was too near the machine gun fire. And for whatever reason, it had just burst his, his ear. And he couldn't hear, couldn't hear in one ear. And he reaches up into the air and he takes the oil that isn't there and he rubs it in his ears and he can hear. And right across the room that began to happen with people. So that's when I, I just thought that'll save you standing up. If you could just, I'm not gonna ask you to stand up but I am gonna ask you to reach up. Now, I don't necessarily recommend it still. I don't recommend that you do this in church. This is just for fun, right? It's just fun. I mean, you can do it in church. It's fun, but it's just for us and just for fun. If people came in from the outside and we've all got our hands in the air reaching into the oil, it just looks a little bit strange. Yeah. But that's what, that's what we're going to do. So what I'm going to invite you to do, if you're at all deaf, if you have tinnitus, if you have hard of hearing, if you've got 30% hearing, if your hearing is gone entirely... Uh, then I'm gonna, we're going to begin there, and then we'll all do it. So we'll try it with those guys first. Or if you have eyesight problems, you know, if you're, how, how can we hear a story like the story earlier and not believe that the Lord would be in the room to bring healing to eyesight? If you, if you wear contacts, uh, everywhere we go at the minute, we're seeing people who are having to take off their glasses, not because their eyes are completely restored, but because their prescription is changing before their eyes, and their glasses no longer work for them. So their eyesight is improving. So you might want to rub it in your eyes if you have any ophthalmic condition, blepharitis, other ophthalmic conditions, you might want to rub it in your eyes. Uh, and so we'll start with the deaf and those with eyesight conditions, and then we'll all have a go at it. Does that sound okay? Yeah? Not clinically deaf, just people who have hearing issues, hearing problems or whatever. And at the minute, my ears, like Mark's, are completely blocked. It's not a spiritual thing, it just as the sinuses and the cause. So I'm about to give you what I don't have. Isn't that kind? That's <laughs> kind. So uh, this is what we do. We just simply reach up into the oil and we rub it in our ears or our eyes. Okay? So if you're hard of hearing, if you need change in your eyesight, go ahead and reach up. Rub it in. We'll do it three times. Rub it in. There's no magic in the number three. We're just having fun. Uh, and then a second time, reach into the oil. Father, thank you for your provision in the room. And then just release it again. Rub it right into your eyes or ears. And then a third time, far above what we could ask or imagine or even think. And we're going to rub it in our ears and our eyes. Just whatever that looks like. If you need healing that. Now, and this is where the fun is. Anyone experiencing change, improvement, or healing? So check out your eyesight, check out your hearing. Experiencing change, improvement, or healing. Then again, I think it's probably easiest. It's not an eyesight issue for me. It's just hard to see somewhat in the balcony. If you clap, and we'll be able to see that. It'll draw attention to it. So, okay, let's try it one more time. Hands in the air. Oh, everybody's doing it. Okay, are you, are you, are you all hard of hearing? And <laughs> you're there. Okay, well, why don't, since you're all doing it anyway, why don't you just take it and then rub it, only if it's appropriate, only if it's legal, then rub it into the part of your body where you need healing, okay? So knees, not the buttocks, the knees, heart, wherever it is that you need. You know, so go ahead, put it right up. Reach into the oil and then rub it into the knees, the hips, wherever it is that you need healing. Chest, the head, wherever it is. And then reach up again. And again, just grab some oil. And then rub it in. That should be enough. And then try it out. You will have to try it out still. Nothing changes till you try it out. So you will have to try it out. Might be tennis elbow that's gone. Might be frozen shoulder that's gone. That condition. Okay, change, improvement, or healing. Where are you? 
go ahead and, and wave or clap or holler. Oh, this way it gets fun. Experiencing change, improvement, or healing. Don't make it up. But if it's you, go ahead and wave, holler. Going once. And you're trying it out. You've tried out that right knee. You're absolutely convinced when you rub the oil into it that it didn't change. Go ahead and try it out. You might be surprised. Your lady will help you. You're over 40 years of age. You've got a bad right knee. You just rubbed oil in it. You might find it's a little bit better. You might find it. Okay. So left knee, it's better. And I know you, so you're telling the truth. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Okay, okay, left knee is close enough to the right, but we have a right knee, do we? I don't think I'm shouting, but wonderful. That's stunning. Love that. Stunning. Okay, go ahead and try it out. I think you'll see some change. Yeah? Yeah. Right knee. Thank you. It's a lot easier. Wonderful. Wonderful. Elsewhere. Some folks with uh, conditions in your wrist. I'm not sure what it is. It might be carpal tunnel or something. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So why don't you go ahead? Has it changed there? Is there anything? So go ahead and stretch into the air. Stretch in, rub it in your ears. Do that three times. And a second time. And in again, and rub it right in, and then one time more. It's like thunder. When I'm speaking, it's like thunder. The third time. Yeah, yeah. And then someone nearby just pretends you're praying. <laughs> and see if she can hear. It would be wonderful. Is there any change? You pretend you're praying over there and uh, see how it is by the end. Anyone else? Change improvement or healing? Yeah. Yeah. No, until you try again. Wow. Wow, that's wonderful. That's what happens when you connect with oil, right? It lubricates. It just makes it a little bit freer. It's wonderful. Anyone else? Anywhere else? Any, any eyes? Any eyes say? Change. Going once. I really ought to teach. <laughs> Going twice. Oh, my eyes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, blurred vision, it's clearing a little, it's not all the way there, but it's getting better. Wonderful, wonderful. It's just nice. Right, what is that? I don't know. Do you, do you know what I say to our guys at home? Just stick a weird sticker on it. Right, I, don't, I don't fully get how it works that we put our hands in the air into imaginary oil and it makes a difference, but sometimes it does. And I'm more than comfortable with the Lord doing things we don't understand. Right. If we had time this morning, I, I would have talked to you about two things. I would have said, always remember the awesomes and the awkward. So I know those moments where it looks like nothing is happening, that's where the awesome is hidden. When people are like, oh no, it's not gonna work. It's inconceivable. It's inconceivable. If the Lord is here, it is absolutely inconceivable that people couldn't be healed. It just doesn't, I don't have any frame of reference for that. It would be inconceivable to me that someone somewhere wouldn't be being healed because the Lord is here. 
So it doesn't mean everyone's getting healed, but someone somewhere will get healed. And if we can remember the awesomes and the awkward, that'll help. Okay, that has nothing to do with what we want to look at. Uh, what we want to look at in this session together is the passion of the Holy Spirit. We began uh, yesterday evening on the perspective of the, of the Holy Spirit, learning to think differently, operating with a transformed, a renewed mind. Uh, we talked earlier this morning on the power of the Holy Spirit and uh, learning to seek the power of the Holy Spirit and steward the power of the Holy Spirit. And uh, this afternoon, I want to chat to you a little bit on what is the passion of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the life of God is too great to be confined to the church. This kingdom, this gospel is big enough for the whole city. It's big enough for the whole nation. It's big enough for the whole world. And God's passion, his desire, because there is such largeness in his heart, because his heart is so expansive, his desire is that expansive hope would break in on hurting humanity. And everywhere you look around, there are people who are desperately hurting and secretly hoping. They're wondering if it's possible to escape the only life they've ever known and embrace the only life they've ever wanted. And all across our culture today, I love being in Cheltenham for lunch, all across you can see people who are desperately longing for something more in their life. And the reason that the Holy Spirit was given to the church was for the world. He was given to the church and he was given for the world. This is what it says in Acts 1 8, isn't it? You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And as a result, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now I've reached the age in life uh, where I don't know if my pains are my pains or someone else's, but there may be someone else in your right knee is just being healed. Either that or I've got a sore right knee. Uh, so you'll want to check that out. Okay. The Spirit doesn't only want to rest upon us. He loves to rest upon us, but he wants to send us. He wants to send us. He wants to lead us beyond renewal into reaching others. So into where we're personally experiencing renewal, into where we're leading others into the life that the Father makes available. He's not only honest for our fullness, he's honest for their emptiness. And we'll see this as we journey a little bit. But you're, you're already more full than you could possibly contain. And it's heaven's hope, it's heaven's passion that lost and broken people be found. And so the Spirit of God is given to the church. And the church, as she goes after the loss, as she lays her life down for those who don't know Jesus, in that moment she becomes irresistible to the Spirit of God. In other words, we get more of the Holy Spirit. Well, really we don't. But the Spirit rests upon us more as we give away what we feel we don't have to a broken world, as we reach beyond our borders. And uh, that's certainly been true for our church. You know, we, we never, uh, what became embarrassing to us is we were seeing all these people coming to faith uh, in different ways in their community. And then we'd show up in churches and we would tell our story of people coming to faith. And then we'd say, come Holy Spirit, like we have always done within the, the vineyard. And we would say, come Holy Spirit. And crazy things would break out in the room. And it, uh, people would laugh and there'd be all sort of falling over and all that. And we were thinking, why are these people doing this? Why are they falling over? Why are they laughing? We don't want any of this to happen. It'd be deeply embarrassing if my boss from work comes and yeah. So in our church, we didn't do any of that stuff. We, we didn't mind that we didn't do any of that because we had figured out by that time, the Spirit's on us for them. And I want, if, if the, the best thing, the best use of my life, other than exalting the Lord Jesus, the best use of my life is to lead people who don't know him into an encounter with them. That's the deepest desire, at the core of my being. That's what I well, and we would travel around these churches and renewal would begin to break out in these communities and it was slightly awkward for us. We didn't know how to handle it. And sooner or later we figured out, well, we better just open the door to this. And uh, please forgive me if this offends you, but I can remember sitting with us. Actually, I won't. I won't even go there. Yeah. Here's, here's the thing. No, no, trust me. <laughs> here's the thing. If when we lean into pursuing the supernatural, you might occasionally stumble into renewal. But if you lean into pursuing lost people, you will inescapably encounter the supernatural. Let me say that again. When you lean into pursuing the supernatural, you might occasionally stumble into renewal. But if you lean into lost people, broken people, you will inescapably encounter the supernatural. God will begin showing up because you've just gone on mission with what he's doing in the world. The Spirit, the Sovereign Lord is upon us said Jesus, or upon me, to bring good news to the poor. 
And with that, the active presence of the Holy Spirit and his power resting on us, we have no good news for the poor. We have nothing that we can bring them that would liberate them or transform them or lead them into life. And so therefore, all of that to say, our immersion in the Spirit must be coupled with an intentional bias towards broken humanity. Those two things must go together. I must be absolutely drenched in the Spirit of God and I must reach out to my neighbor who knows not who God is. Those two things are inseparable. Being filled with the Holy Spirit, if it does nothing else, it leads us into a community. If it does nothing else, it leads us into our community. He's in us for us and he's on us for them. And uh, when, when we describe this, we describe it a little bit like the difference between a bodybuilder and a weightlifter. Are there any bodybuilders here? Gareth, other than Gareth. <laughs> Wonderful. I think I'm safe. I usually do this in a room where there are bodybuilders. Uh, but you, you know, a bodybuilder, like they, they bulk up and they get tons of muscle and they do it so that they can wear fake tan and look at themselves in the mirror and pose. <laughs> like it's the strangest thing. Like it is Gareth. <laughs> I'm sorry, mate. Even I am joining in. See that? How bad company corrupts good character. And Tim. And that's all bodybuilders do. They mass muscle so they can look at how muscular they are in the mirror and wear fake tan. Weightlifters, on the other hand, they build muscle with the idea of lifting weights. And for too long, the church has been observing her moral muscle. For too long, she's been getting more and more holy, more and more whatever it is, more and more renewal, more and more, more and more. And she's just looking at herself in the mirror, wondering, have I got it all yet? But God wants the church to build muscle, not so we can look at ourselves, but so that we can lift the burden off of our community and begin to go to broken humanity and say, here, let us help you with that. The Spirit of the Lord is on us so that you don't have to carry the things that you've been carrying. We have a solution from heaven that brings an introduction into your life that resets the course of your life. And it is time for the church to stop operating as a bodybuilder constantly obsessed with how she's doing, whether her muscles are declining or growing, and begin to operate as a weightlifter, out there among the people, lifting the burdens. We want to be people who understand that holiness is the welcome mat of heaven. That holiness isn't what I use to define whether I'm separate from you. Holiness is the very thing that is the generosity of God that includes those who are lost and broken and alone and afraid and estranged and bereaved and abandoned and marginalized. It is God's holiness that moves us towards justice. It's his holiness that expresses his mercy. It is who he is as the Holy Spirit within us that causes us to move towards lost people. The Holy Spirit comes upon the church and moves the church towards lost people. He doesn't just do that because he's the force. He does it because he's holiness and holiness is constantly attracted to that which is lost. And we viewed holiness as this thing that's disengagement from that which is lost. And we've made holiness something that it never was, that it was never intended to be. Jesus was the most holy person there ever was, wasn't he? Yet he was known as the friend of sinners. That's who he was around constantly. His holiness led him to the broken. And so we're going to see that here in a moment. Uh, hopefully we can get through this. Matthew 9.36 is where we're going to journey. So that was Acts 1.8. Matthew 9.36 and following. If you have a Bible or a phone... Here's Jesus doing what Jesus ever does. He's among the people. If you were to say, what is the one thing that we could do as a community to cultivate the ongoing inbreaking of God's kingdom? What's the one thing that we could do to steward the power of the Holy Spirit? What's the one thing we must do to sustain the revival that God is birthing in us? The one thing that you have to do above all else is find a way to take it beyond the church. Find a way to take it among the people. Find a way to break out. Find a way, uh, really, really. I, I, I think I love Luke's song. Luke is a good friend of mine. I love the song, Spirit Break Out. We don't need the spirit to break out. We need the church to break out. The spirit's already broken up. It's ours who are confined. The spirit's already at work in our communities. He's already at work in our culture. He's waiting for us to come join him. 
And spirit break out is great, but what we really mean is, God do the work, let us stay here. We'll welcome them when they come near. Yeah. That's really what we mean. That's what we mean. And it's not who he is. It's not who the spirit of God is. He won't answer that prayer. It's not who he is. So anyway, before I get on my hobby horse, when Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion in them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And we move towards the lost with a view of God's mercy. Jesus had learned to see the whole of humanity through the lens of divine mercy. He'd learned to discover that God had written mercy over every individual and over every institution. There is nowhere that you can go on planet Earth that God hasn't written a purpose and a promise of mercy over that people group or over that place. And we learn because of the mercy that's captivated us, because of the mercy that's rescued us, because of the mercy that's freed us from addiction and abandonment, from abuse, from pornography and fornication, because of that mercy, we learn that no one in our city, no one in our community is beyond the reach of God's mercy. And we were never supposed to live our lives outside of mercy. But the better thing in that is we were never supposed to see our city outside of mercy. We're always supposed to see where's God's mercy moving here. And Jesus is moved with compassion. And in the kingdom of God, compassion, not ordination, is what qualifies you to minister. That's why there have been women bishops long before there were women bishops. I know it's politically incorrect, but it's absolutely true. You know, it doesn't matter if you become a bishop. If you don't have compassion, you can't minister the kingdom. Compassion is the kingdom qualification to ministry, not ordination. Isn't that good news? That means we all get to do it. We all get to do it. And Jesus had compassion. And the Great Commission is an invitation to a life of great compassion. We don't need, do we? We don't need anyone else, any more people embarking on the Great Commission without great compassion. People bringing good news without being good news don't work. It doesn't work. And the Spirit's on us to bring good news and to be good news in a community. And here in this passage, Jesus isn't taking the city for God. He's just loving the broken city back to life. I love that. I love that Jesus' goal, his passion is to wash the feet of the city. We'll talk about that more this evening on what he does. People are just transformed by mercy. It's why Paul writes and he says, in view of God's mercy, take your everyday ordinary life and present it as an offering before God. Take what you do in your nine to five and present it as an offering before God and do so recognizing that his mercy is written over every environment. Uh, just a few people, call out where you work. Bristol. Bristol. And the companies that you work for. Schools. Schools, yeah. Lights. Yeah. Lloyds. Lloyds, wonderful. God's mercy is written all over Lloyds. Lloyds needs mercy. <laughs> we need mercy. Everywhere we go, we need that mercy. And you never graduate mercy. You simply become a mercy carrier. Someone who's been won by compassion and gives it to others. And this is the passion of the Holy Spirit. He longs to see lost and broken people come home. And for years, we've separated in the church things that were never designed to be separate. Let me just check if I have permission to do this. We kind of made like churches become corner dwellers. So over here you have like the scripture movement. You know, everything has to be theological and doctrinal and all of that. And I'm thoroughly passionate for that. I believe God is all over his book. It's his book. He's all over that. And in this corner we have the, the um, so we've got the scripture guys there. Then we've got the salvation guys over here. It's all about seeing lost people won. And we're all over that. I love it when the lost come home. It's the happiest days I think we just heard this morning of another 40 young kids yesterday and teachers giving their life to Christ. It's just stunning. But the salvation guys, they get a little bit worried about the scripture guys because they're not doing enough with it. And the scripture guys, they get a little bit worried about salvation. They said, yeah, they put up their hand, but did they know what they were doing? Yeah, they, yeah it's converts, but is it really disciples? 
Yeah, and the scripture guys have these questions. And then over here, they don't have to be in these corners, but over here, you've got like the signs and wonders guys. Whoa, yay. Ah. <laughs> the scripture guys are looking at them thinking, what are you on? <laughs> these guys are looking at these guys saying, you value the book, but the experiences that gave birth to the book, you ignore. And they're confused by that until the salvation guys are like, yeah, it's great that people get saved, but what about the rest? Sozo is more than just salvation. It's all that. And they're all having this battle. And over here, there's the social justice guys. And they can be in any corner. And they're saying, let justice roll like a river and righteousness like a never failing stream. And they're quoting scripture. And the scripture guys are like, you are so liberal. <laughs> and the salvation guys are saying what? They're saying to them, yeah, but it's no point feeding them if they're going to hell. Yeah, it's great that you rescued her from slavery, but what about eternal damnation? That's what they're saying. The signs and wonders guys are saying, "Whoa!" <laughs> <laughs> and they're in there. I know what we've we've split into these corners, but there's one church and one spirit and one faith. And he loves it all. He loves it when people come to faith. He loves it when signs and wonders happen. He loves it when the poor receive mercy and justice begins to flood our streets. And he loves it most when all of that is done, rooted in scripture in a way that's transforming culture. He loves it all. And it's time to kind of no longer separate what God has joined together. We are steeped in mercy. And then we're sent in mercy. And to be sent is an incredible thing. Jesus says to his disciples here, he says, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to ask the Lord of the harvest. Incidentally, notice that God thinks he's Lord of the harvest. Not just Lord of the church, but Lord of those who don't go to church. Lord of those who golf on Sunday. Lord of the golfers, the Sunday timesers. Lord of the harvest. And she says, ask him to send out workers into his harvest field. Ask him to send out people who bring life to the city. A little later on, he'll say, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. And this is what happens when the church awakens to the third person. She becomes a sent community, sent in glory, sent in authority, sent in humility, sent to bring uh, people who are experiencing brokenness into fullness, sent as the people of God. Everyone, every day, everywhere commissioned to bring life. And God has always been a sending God, hasn't he? When he heard the cry of his people in slavery, the Bible says he sent Moses. When a community of God began to drift from their purpose and calling, God sent them prophets. There came a man sent from God, his name was John, John the Baptist. The Bible says God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Then it says this, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save. He did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. He sent his son, then he sent his spirit. And now he's sending us. Jesus said, my food, in John 4, my food is to do the will of the one who sent me. And Jesus understood that he was sent. He said, I don't get any satisfaction unless I know that I'm sent. And the church is the group of people in the community who have been sent to bring back life. That's what we do. I'm not pausing for dramatic effect just because my cold is getting worse by the moment. Pray for me, pray for me. See, at its best, the church is not sitting in circles asking God to unleash hope and hurt in hearts. At its best, the church is this community of sent people. We're the sent ones. To every prayer that we're praying over a community, God changed Cheltenham. Do you know what the answer from heaven is? And so send I you. God transformed poverty in our nation and the answer comes from heaven and so send I you. God bring hope to the marginalized and God speaks and says and so send I you. And we look around and we're like, haven't you got anyone else? He's like, no, I love to work through weak broken vessels. I love to display my mercy in them. So send I 
you. And the answer to the hunger at the heart of humanity is sent people. Now, there's a world of difference between being sent and being invited. To be sent means that you carry authority. It means that you've been commissioned. It means you've been given what you need to get the job done. If you're invited, it won't make a difference unless you're sent. And if you're sent, it won't make a difference that you haven't been invited. In other words, when you show up at a board meeting in your work, it won't make a difference that they haven't asked for your solution from heaven if you've been sent. You'll be able to bring a solution that will save the company an absolute fortune. We had a wonderful moment this week where someone was visiting our church from America and they were there to prophesy over some people in our church. It's all good fun. And I, but I said, hey, let's get some words for them. And uh, one of our children's pastor, who's normally the most distracted member of our staff team, I think that's probably universally true that children's pastors are just slightly distracted. And Dave is, is just does an amazing job. Um, but he looks at this guy and he says, I have a word for you. 400,000. The guy just begins to weep and to weep and to weep. And he's a businessman. He'd come to our church. He was testing us because he'd heard that we were unleashing businesses in the city. He was testing us a little bit. And he'd said in his heart, God, would you show me? He's about to do a deal. The guy back home had offered, uh, was wanting 750000 He knew that wasn't the right figure. And he says, God, would you show me the exact amount that I'm supposed to bid in this? This guy turns to him and says, I have a word for you, 400000 He goes back home. He emails me today. He emails me today or last night, and he says, hey, I just want you to know that the guy immediately accepted 400,000. Yes. Stunning. Saved them 350,000 pounds. That's a good solution. Right? <laughs> See, we, we don't want to simply gather in the presence of, his, of the Father. We want to carry his presence to our businesses, to our communities, to our families, don't we? And that's what happens when the Holy Spirit rests in us. He sends us with a solution. So Jesus sends them out real quickly. The Bible says he gave them authority. Verse 1. Jesus called his 12 to him and gave them authority. Drive out impure spirits to heal every disease and sickness. Incidentally, for Jesus, the supernatural signs and wonders were an act of mercy. They actually are the way that the mercy of God is displayed. The spirit of mission is the spirit of mercy. Okay, so Jesus sends them out. He gives them authority. And we know this and we get this. But the kingdom advances through authority, not activity. It doesn't matter how busy we get in church, if we're not carrying authority, nothing changes in our community. Gathered environments help grow churches, but only scattered servants change communities. We can, we can do great gatherings and we're good at them and we ought to do them. But the thing that changes our cities is when the individuals in our church understand that they've been sent. That's what begins to cause a transformation of the city. Right now, one in every 40 people, it's changing, it's coming closer to 30, one in every 40 people in our town come to our church. We probably reach one in about five to eight. And it's changing. But it's not changing through Sundays, and it's not changing through services, and it's not changing through sermons, it's changing through servants. People who know who they are, know what they carry, and know that nowhere is difficult. And Jesus commissions his disciples. He gives them authority. And he says, go. Now, the word authority and the word author are kind of linked, aren't they? Authority is what God gives you to rewrite the story of your city. We dare not leave home without authority. And I know what you're thinking because I've thought the same. I, I don't feel like I have authority. What does authority look like? And I imagine these guys had the same thing. But Jesus just says, hey, I'm giving you authority. What does it look like when people have authority? Well, it looks a lot like vulnerability. What's the most glorious symbol of authority in the planet? It's the cross, isn't it? But it looks a lot like vulnerability. We, we imagine authority, if we had it, we would look like really strong. But it's actually when we're really weak that we walk in authority the most. It's when we don't have it and we still give it away that we walk in authority. Jesus sends out the 12. Verse 8, and we're rushing through this. Verse 9, chapter 10. These 12, verse 5, firstly, these 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions, and then it lists them. 
cleanse the lepers, heal the sick, all of that. Verse nine, he sent them out with these instructions. Don't get any gold or silver or copper. Take with you in your belts, no bag for the journey or extra shirt or sandals or staff for the worker is worth his keep. What he's basically saying is, hey, I'm sending you out, but the good news is I'm sending you out empty. And when the Spirit of God sends us, he usually sends us empty. We keep waiting on him to fill us. And here's how it works. He sends you out empty. You give away what you don't have. And as you stretch out your hand to give away what you don't have, he fills your life. So the good news today is you don't have to have it all together to give it all away. Do you know that Elisha was dead when he raised the man from the dead? Like what possible qualification can a dead person have for raising someone from the dead? Threw him in, touched Elisha's bones and he came back to life. You don't have to have it all together. You say, don't I need great faith to change my city? No. No, you just need to show up. You just need to show up. Don't, don't I need God to film again? No. No, you just need to rise and shine and show up somewhere where there's broken, lonely, afflicted people and begin to give them what you have. You just need to be a servant. The Spirit rests upon the servants. Doesn't he? Aren't you glad that he took the kingdom out of the hands of experts and he put it in the hands of servants? I know you must be tired. But here's the thing. You don't need to have another encounter. You just need to show up. Arise, shine. Your light's already come. Glory of the Lord's already rising upon you. Does that mean we don't gather in events like this? No, we still gather. We can never do enough of that in my view. But what we must do then is take what we've received and release it into the community, giving away all the time what the Father has put in our hands. And the folks who get this quickest and best around our community are our kids. Our kids get this super quick. We, we just see the most remarkable, uh, what God is doing in our kids blows away. You, you will have heard, you may not have heard, uh, but our, our church launched a number of years ago a ministry called Healing in the Streets, where we take the power of God. We're just looking for a way to take it beyond the building. You need to know, uh, you don't need to know this, but I'm going to tell you this. The best part of healing on the streets for me is not the healing part. I don't really mind whether people get healed or not. The part that I love the most is the church is finally on the streets. If it takes healing to get us there, I'm all good with that. That's great for me, but I don't mind. We're showing up in the middle of the town center, hearing, pastoring the city. I love that. Out there where people are broken, I'll getting the privilege of hearing their amazing story. And we see some remarkable healings. Now, anyway, over the last number of months, our three and four-year-olds have been doing a thing at church, and sometimes a two-year-old called Healing on the Seats where they get these little kids' seats. And uh, our adults drop them off and then they say, any you want in prayer? And they just take a seat in these little small seats and these three and four-year-olds come and they lay hands on them and they get healed. With women with issues of blood, instantly healed. It's a little three, four-year-old. Our kids aged between five and nine, once a month they go into our town, they do treasure hunts, they pray for the sick, they prophesy over people, they're seeing the kingdom. It's just the most stunning thing. And they constantly delight in surprises. And they're kids, so they're really annoying at times as well. <laughs> but they're kids. But one of the best stories that we heard recently, and I don't remember them all, but one of our favorite ones recently is that one of her parents was dropping her kid off at school and this other mother came over to her and she got in her face. She was really irate and she said, I'm tired of this vineyard. I'm tired of their propaganda. Everywhere I look in this school, there's more invites. She said, I'm going to the principal and I'm going to let them know what I think. So as good as her word, she went to the principal. And she said, I don't know why you keep letting these people in. You keep letting them put their stuff up in the school. I'm tired of it. I'm sick of it. I don't want my kid near it. You need to stop this. And the principal looks at her. He's not a Christian. He says, it's the kids. So we can't stop them. They're telling everyone about this church. <laughs> we can't stop them. It's kids. The kids were putting up the posters. The kids were inviting their friends. The kids are leading people to you. It's not uncommon. It's not uncommon. It's not, it doesn't happen all the time. It's not uncommon for kids in the middle of class at school, this is seven, eight, nine year olds, to turn to a friend and say, can I pray for you right now? To watch their friend be healed right there in class. Completely normal. For them. And they catch 
that they carry something. They've understood authority at a level that we're still trying to connect with. And, and you would look at them and you would say, world changes? Probably not. But we're looking at them and saying, my goodness, these guys are changing everything. Nowhere is safe. One of the women in our church was in Ikea. She's doing her shopping. She's, you know, like the way Ikea is, you have to go all the way through the shopping. So by the time you get to the end, the kids are really bored. And she said, kids, just, just go and play or something while I put this through. And kids were, uh, Taya's what, seven at that point. Rosie would be about eight or nine. And Emma's about 11. She says, you go play. And uh, so, so she's putting her stuff through the thing at Ikea. And she looks up and she sees her girls with the man collecting for the blind who's blind. And she thinks, oh no. <laughs> she knows exactly what they're doing. They're right there praying for the blind man. Because for them, that's fun. She's like, go play, and they're like, oh, there's a blind man, let's go pray with him. And they're not exceptional, they're just normal, everyday kids, and they're normal in a community, but they understand the authority that they carry. They get that they've been sent. And the thing about authority is you never see it until you give it away. That's the strange thing. You never feel like you've got it until you give it away. It's why wherever I go and I model healing, I usually try to pray for something I have wrong with me. I love the fact that I'm not healed in that area. It pretty much guarantees that people will be healed in that area. That's a daft way to look at life, isn't it? Normal people don't think like that. But when you understand, hey, I don't have it, this can only be God. He alone can give it. You begin to see authority come, and Jesus sends them out with nothing. And I can almost hear the whisper of the Father say, you're my children, and I've given you good things to share. And as you follow me, you're gonna encounter people who are far from me, people who are fighting for faith, people who are struggling in their marriages, people who are longing for healing, wondering if I'm alive, people who prayed last night that I would show up. And as you follow me, you're gonna to begin to lead them into life. So I wanna encourage you today. Go, go in mercy. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and earth is given to me, therefore go. Go for sure. Very few people actually go and very few of those who do go remember to take their authority. But if you go in mercy with great compassion and if you'll take authority, you'll begin to see some of the things that for you were inconceivable in your city or your community, you begin to see them change. You begin to see them broken because the Lord has written mercy and authority all over your community. Okay, I think that's probably as much as we want to do. Uh, could we stand for a moment? Just for a moment. I think we'll do this just where we are because it's afternoon and you must be tired. Do you know I've gone and done? Oh no, I haven't. We're good, I was getting confused in the time. the moment that I always love where we invite the Holy Spirit to come and to put in our hearts his passion for lost people. So here's, here's what we're going to do in a moment, uh, just where we are. Uh, this is what we do with our kids. Would you wash your hands? My good wash, and then just hang them out to dry. Just. Do my I'm gonna ask you again, if you would, just as you're receiving, I'm gonna ask you if you would invite the Lord to fill you. But this time you're gonna make a promise. You're not bribing them, you're not bargaining with them, but you're gonna make a promise. And here's what you're gonna say. God, if you'll fill me again, I will take it beyond the building. I'll take it to the lost. I'll find a way. I don't care how silly it makes me look, but I'll find a way to get out there in the community. If you'll just fill me again. If you'll fill me again, Lord, if you'll give me your passion and your compassion for lost people, I will find a way in my workplace. I'll find a way at the school gates. I'll find a way at the retirement home. I'll find a way, God, to communicate your compelling mercy. Holy Spirit, come and send me. Come and send me. Come upon me, rest upon me, and release me to release others. Spirit of the Lord, come. And if today that's your passion and your prayer, there's oil 
from the Holy Spirit for you. As daft as it looks to put your hands in the middle of thin air and believe that healing could come and then watch it happen, so it's the same in this moment. That as you lean into the invisible God, something in your community already is beginning to change just by virtue of the fact that you're leaning in. But the Lord wants to give you more. So I'm asking you in this moment as we receive, I'm asking you to receive for your city. And I'm asking you to receive for the broken. And I'm asking you to receive for the poor. Understanding that it's your task to give away what it is that he's about to put in your hands. Can we do that together? Yeah. Can we do that? Then Father, under agreement, under agreement, I ask that you would release now your spirit to your people for the sake of the lost. That you would release intercession in the room. You would release intercession in the room. And you would release compassion in the room. That's the spirit of the Lord. Let it come. It's his compassion all over you. Let it come. It's compassion. She's starting at the front. She's making its way back. Let it come. Let his compassion come. It's right at the front. It's just making its way back. It's compassion for your city, for your town. More God, more compassion. And now we release intercession at the same time, God. We release intercession. That we begin to be an identification with your heart for our community in increasing measure. We release intercession. Let it come, let it come upon you. Let him clothe you. Let him clothe you with compassion and intercession. Let it come. Just right at the front. It's like the third row back now. It's moving back. It's on the balcony today. I can't see up there, guys. I'm so sorry, but it's bound to be up there too. Front row on the balcony. Just at the top, right ahead of me there. It's the compassion of the Lord coming upon you, lady. Take more. Take more. More, God. It comes even more. Compassion, intercession. Power come. Power come. I want you to know it's not for you, it's for them. It's not for you, it's for them. Power come, that's it. That's it, Lord, more. Just begin to break out right across the room. It's about, I think, about five rows back now. I'm slightly further. Lord, more, all the way. All that is, is the first contraction. The second contraction's coming. Now here it is. More, God. More. More, God. Let it come. You need to know that compassion will break you. Intercession will break you. His heart for the city will break you. He's looking for willing carriers of his presence. Willing carriers of his passion. Willing distributors of his authority. Freely you've received, freely give. It's about seven rows back now. Just keep him breaking out. Lord, the right hand side to just let it break out. 
intercession and compassion come. That's the second contraction. <coughs> now here it comes. It's the third contraction. You're just about to hit. I'm just going to begin to hit some of you guys at the back. I'm going to begin to experience it. Lord, release it now. Release it now. Let your power come. Power come. Now, Lord, more for the intercessors, more oh. compassion, more your kingdom. Intercession and compassion coming. More. More for the city. More. Here it is, just increasing. It's increasing. Don't worry if you're not crying or yelping. It's, that's, all of that's entirely appropriate. You don't have to do it. But if he's doing that in you, let him do his work in you. Fill up with the sufferings of Christ, as Paul said the sake of the city let intercession and compassion come Lord on the balcony Father the same at least more okay freedom for the captives let it come Lord let it come freedom for the captives freedom for the captives let it come freedom for the captives That's simply the third contraction. Here's number four. It's freedom for the captives. More, God. More. And the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on you. He's on you to bring a solution. Everywhere you have compassion, you carry a solution. Lord, more. More. That's just almost right at the back there. It's Lord, more. Now go ahead and lift up your voice. Go ahead and lift, where you choose to do that, just go ahead and lift up your voice. Intercession. Go ahead, lift up your voice for your time, for your area, for your city, for your region. Go ahead and cry out to them. Go ahead and call out to them. Invite kingdom.